This video is meant to introduce you to the some of the fundamental motivating ideas behind differential calculus. So we'll start with a function where as usual we've plotted the argument along the horizontal axis and the value along the vertical axis. You could pick your favorite interval from argument A to argument B, calculate the function values, you could measure the change in function value and the change in argument and when you take the quotient of these quantities you have by definition calculated the average rate of change of f on the interval from a to b. By the way you've also calculated the slope of this line joining those two points on the graph. Now we're going to look at a special case of this kind of problem. Suppose you had a long straight road along which position markers have been erected on the side of the road and there's a car traveling down the road and you are measuring the position of the car as a function of time. So you'd have units of distance and time and for the sake of argument suppose we're using kilometers and hours. In this setting average rate of change is known as average velocity. And by the way, your units for the average velocity in this case would be kilometers per hour, which certainly sounds like a measure of velocity. So let's take a look at an example of this kind of problem. We've got a bead on a, um, a rod, and it's sliding along the rod, and we have a position in centimeters marked out by the ruler, and we're going to watch the bead move for 12 seconds. So it starts traveling to the right, turns around, drifts to the left, maybe it stalls out for a few seconds, and then it's going to make a spurt to the left to end. So we can use this data to analyze the motion. On the interval from 0 to 3, the change in position was 6 units, and the change in time was 3 units, and so the average velocity on the interval from 0 to 3 turns out to be 2 centimeters per second. And similarly, we can analyze various intervals. And on the interval from 3 to 6, the position is negative 2 because it moved 2 units to the left. And so its average velocity over this interval turns out to be negative, in fact, negative 0.67, roughly, centimeters per second. The average velocity on the interval from 6 to 10 is pretty easy to calculate. There was no change in position. So this average velocity turns out to be 0 centimeters per second. And the average velocity on the last two-second interval from 10 to 12 turns out to be negative 3 because it was 6 units to the left in two seconds. So there's the average rate of change, the speediest part of the drip, trip for the particle. Let's ask a different kind of question. Let's find intervals or estimate an interval on which the average velocity is 0 0.25 centimeters per second. So the key to this is going to be to imagine what a slope of one quarter looks like. And so you have to imagine intervals for which the endpoints, when you find the corresponding points on the graph, have a slope of, of one quarter. So for example, from 1 to about 10.2, roughly. Of course, there are other possibilities. If you had a ruler, you could try to move it along parallel and keep finding these spots and you can estimate, since the problem was to estimate, that's not an issue. And these are just four intervals that work, but obviously there are other possibilities. The point of this though is, let yourself think graphically when possible, because often the graphical way of going about a problem is, is pretty nice. It's, it's pretty convenient to be able to have that option. So let's, let's recall what it means to be a tangent line and a secant line. So a tangent line is a line that intersects a circle once, and a secant line is a line that intersects a circle twice. And we're going to try to use this language and incorporate it into our discussion of rates of change. So one way to draw a secant line for a circle is to pick two points on the circle and draw a line. And when you think about it, that's what you're really doing with an average rate of change. You're picking two points on the graph of f, and then you're calculating the slope of the line joining those two points. And because of that, we'll call this a secant slope of f on the interval from a to b. Or maybe we'll just say the secant slope of f from a to b. Now besides being a convenient notion, 
a convenient um, terminology, it, it actually suggests a possible direction of inquiry. So a tangent line is a line that intersects a circle just once. And so that leads you to wonder what you might mean by a tangent line to a graph. Now, that looks like the right analog. And you could, you could ask, well, is the definition then a line that intersects the graph just once? Turns out this is a shockingly bad definition. This does not capture the behavior we want at all. And it just takes a few examples to see why that works. So in this case, we're going to have an argument where a line slashes through and intersects the graph just once. And clearly, that's not what we had in mind for a tangent line. So we're going to have to rule that one out. And the kind of behavior we really want is something that just touches once. So this behavior is what we really have in mind. And you look at the behavior near this point, and that's exactly what we want in the, in the tangent line. Um, and so we'll declare this to be a tangent line. And, but we'll notice that if you extend what we've now called a tangent line, it actually intersects the graph a couple other locations. But somehow these are incidental. These really don't, they don't matter. It's a tangent line, even though it intersects the graph three times. So the definition of a tangent line is clearly subtle. It's more subtle than a tangent line for a circle. We're going to have to work at it. So suppose you pick an argument, and here's what we clearly have in mind to be the tangent line at this argument. And the question then is, how do we find this tangent line? We have a point already, a comma f of a. So we have a point on the line. That means the only other thing we need to know is the slope. So really, this all boils down to the issue, what is the tangent slope at x equals a? How are we going to find the slope of this line we're looking for? So the way we're going to do it is we're going to calculate a secant slope. So we're going to calculate the secant slope from a to x. Now clearly, that's not what we want. But we could let x sneak up to a. And the closer x gets to a, the closer the secant slope seems to match the target, the slope we want to calculate. Now, it gets so tantalizingly close, you might think we could just let x actually equal a. But that's a real problem, because look at the formula. If x equals a, you have 0 in the denominator. That's a disaster. So we can't just let x equal a. So we can sneak up from the left as well. Either way we sneak up, we're getting these slopes that look a lot like the one we want, but we can't just evaluate it when x equals a. So we're going to have to do something subtle. We're going to have to somehow sneak up on the number we're looking for without actually getting there. And the official way to do this is through a gadget called a limit. So the tangent slope is going to turn out to be the limiting value as x approaches a of the secant slope. So this gadget is a new mysterious thing that we're going to have to develop a theory for, and that will occupy several classes in the near future. But that won't stop us from trying to analyze specific examples. Let's gather numerical evidence to guess the tangent slope of the function f of x equals x squared at the argument x equals 1. So here we have a graph of this simple function, and there's the argument where we want to find the tangent slope. So our strategy is going to be first to introduce the argument 1 plus h. So here's a nearby argument. And a good question is why are we using this 1 plus h notation. Well, when you take the difference in the arguments, 1 plus h minus 1, you simply get h. So h itself is a nice measure of how far away you are from the argument you care about. So as h goes to 0, you're getting closer to your target. This turns out to be fairly convenient in many cases. So the difference in function values, f of 1 plus h minus f of 1. And so we're going to calculate the secant slope and then we're going to watch what happens as h gets closer to 0, because that's how we sneak up on the tangent slope. 
So we can animate this a bit by letting h go to zero. We're sneaking up on the tangent slope. The secant slopes look more and more like our target. And by the way, letting h be negative allows us to sneak up from the left. So it doesn't have to be just from the right. When h is negative, you'll be coming from the left. Now, to get our data, we're going to use the graphing calculator as an aid in this, in this case. So we'll plot x squared, and then we'll actually use the zoom decimal window to make sure we've got the right function. So now we're going to calculate this quotient. First, we'll store 1 into h. So we're going to take one step to the right. And then we're going to calculate our secant slope formula. And we're going to use the y1 register. And we're going to calculate out our formula. And it's tedious the first time, but we anticipate doing it several times. So we're going to take the trouble to do it once. And then we're going to use second enter to repeat it conveniently. So here's our secant slope when h is 1. So the secant slope is 3 when we go from 1 to 1 plus 1, or 2. So it's the interval from 1 to 2. Now we're going to try 0.1 into h, and we're going to hit second enter a couple times, and we're going to recover that calculation. So by letting h be 0.1, we've now calculated the secant slope to be 2.1. We can go enter 0.01 in for h, redo the calculation, second enter to recover, and there's our secant slope of 2.01. And one last time, 0.001 into h, and we will once again hit second enter enough to recover our secant slope calculation, redo it, and perhaps not shockingly, we get 2.001. So we've got secant slopes sneaking in from the right as h equals 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. So you can do this from the left as well using similar techniques. And from the left means h is actually negative in this case. Now, one thing to notice is h is negative, but so is the function, uh, the difference in the function values. And so the quotient itself is positive, and it still makes sense. The bottom line is this secant slope formula, there's no adjustment you need to make when h is 0. It'll work when h is negative as well. It's just calculate this thing, and it's give you secant slopes. So when h is negative 1, you'll find that the secant slope is 1. And as you approach h equals 0, you're getting these numbers that look a lot closer to 2. Now, you'd like to just plug in 0 for h conceptually, but you can't do it because you get a 0 in the denominator. So you got to rule that out. And what are we left with? We're left with the idea that we can let h approach 0 can't equal 0, but we can approach 0. And we can, meanwhile, look at what's happening to these secant slopes. Now, it's pretty compelling in this table that these values seem to be approaching 2. That seems to be the missing number here in this table. And so what we'll do is we'll guess that the tangent slope of f at 1 is actually equal to 2. And sure enough, if you draw a line with slope 2 right through that point on the graph, it looks an awful lot like a tangent slope. So let's sort of review what's happened here. We've got a picture of either a secant slope or an average rate of change. Take your pick. We've thought of it either way. But when you calculate f of x minus f of a over x minus a, that's what you're getting. Now we can look forward to this limiting process where we let the argument x sneak up on a and get a tangent line. And this is really the gadget we're going to need to understand, this limit, this notion of a limit. But conceptually, we know that the secant slope is going to turn into a tangent slope in this limiting process. And you'll notice that there's one spot missing on the table. What does an average rate of change turn into in this limiting process? We're going to give it a name, and we're going to call it an instantaneous rate of change of f at the argument a. So that's what we mean by an instantaneous rate of change. So if we sort of go full circle back to our original problem, if we have the car traveling down the road, when we ask what's the instantaneous rate, 
of change or instantaneous velocity at time t equals a, what we're really saying is there's a limiting process of average rates of change as you let one of the endpoints approach a.